in order to understand where the COVID-19 pandemic will go next in India, what is the sequence of events that will play out over the following weeks and months, it's necessary to understand where we are now, and what indicators there are currently for what might happen in the future. So let's go back to asking, how did COVID-19 enter the country in the first place and what are the sequence of events that have played out until this particular moment? So COVID-19 came to India in the form, first, through a medical student from Wuhan in China, who had come back to India around the middle of January and was diagnosed positive with the disease around the 30th of January. Starting in January and early February and going on through the months of February and March, the government imposed increasingly stringent requirements on travellers from abroad, especially from, from COVID-19 affected countries. And beyond a point, all of them automatically entered quarantine as soon as they reached India. But before that, they had to keep track of their symptoms and report them if they felt anything unusual, if they felt unwell at any level, as well as to report the nature and, and the health of their close contacts. While this built up, on the 24th of March, the government of India announced a full-scale lockdown of the country. This was to last to the 14th of April. On the 14th of April, the lockdown was further extended to the 3rd of May. On the 1st of May, the lockdown was extended beyond that to the 17th of May, and that's really with the in-between of that is where we are now. On the 20th of April and thereafter, there have been some relaxations of the fairly stringent conditions of the original lockdown, so some districts have been allowed to open up for work and for travel, a little more than other districts. There has been a categorization of districts according to red or orange or green, depending upon whether they had a case of COVID-19 in the two or three weeks preceding that particular date on which the decision was to be made. Given all of that, let's go back and ask, what is COVID-19? How has COVID-19 spread been across the world? If you took a map of the world and you colored it a darker shade, for countries which had a larger number of COVID cases per 100,000 population versus countries which had the smallest number. What to stand out immediately is the dark shades of the US, the UK, Italy, uh, Sweden, and Spain would be painted in, and together with them would be Iran as well, and various countries in South America on the western side, including Ecuador. India would be a lighter shade. That's because the number of cases in India has just not been very large compared to the number of cases, for example, in the US. The USA has had 1.3 million cases approximately at this point. The US has had the UK has had 215,000 cases, and India is around 63,000 cases as of today. If you ask about the fraction of cases that are positive per population, for that our number is fairly small because our population is very large. So we can say that a large fraction of our population has not been infected with the disease so far, as inferred from that single number. If you ask what has been the impact of the disease on the population in terms of fatalities, what you could compute is something called a case fatality rate, which takes the number of fatalities and divides it by the total number of positive cases. That number for India is again somewhere around three, between 3 and 4 percent, which is certainly smaller than the analogous number for the UK and for the US, both of which turn in fairly large numbers on that count. So that's interesting. The case fatality rate which really tells you about the impact of the disease, it doesn't do that in a very precise way. A better measure is the, is the, is the infection fatality rate, which is harder to compute, because at least for COVID-19, as together with many other diseases, we don't really know the total number who are infected. This is something that we can only know retrospectively, going back using advanced microbiological methods. Given all of this, given what we know about fatalities for COVID-19, we can ask, how has the distribution of cases been across India? The answer there is that it's been extremely inhomogeneous. Cases currently, states currently which are showing large numbers of cases include Maharashtra, include Delhi, Gujarat, and then Tamil Nadu. So these are the cases where, and certainly Tamil Nadu had a number of cases which were going down until a super spreader event occurred in the, the Koyamedu market in Chennai. Now the number of cases is on the upswing again. Bombay has, in a sense, been smoldering for a while, and there has been a steady background of cases, which now suddenly seems to have increased, together with clusters in the most crowded parts of Bombay, including in, uh, in slum areas of Bombay, where people are just very closely packed together. And it's hard to imagine how to control disease spread under such extreme crowding circumstances. For Gujarat, we know a little less about how things manage to spread, and the likelihood for all of these places is that a little laxity 
on behalf of enforcement of the earlier curfews, earlier lockdowns, may have been partially responsible for this. About some of the states of India, for example, the states in the center, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, etc., we know somewhat less, their numbers have been smaller. But there are some worries about whether cases have been counted accurately enough. There's also been a worry for Bengal earlier, although now the Bengal data seem to be somewhat cleaner. If you ask about metrics such as the number of tests that are being performed, on any general count, we would be doing very badly. We typically have now for India about one test per thousand members of the population. Compare that to countries like Canada and the US, which have anywhere between 20 and 30 tests that are done and plan to ramp up that number even further. So we don't have a sufficiently large number of tests to be able to tell if the disease is spreading inside the population. And that is a worry that will increasingly become a worry with more crowded areas in Bombay and so on. One way of assessing whether you have enough numbers of tests or not is to ask, is the number of cases that you're detecting going up to the amount of testing that you're doing? And certainly for a state like Bengal, these two track each other very closely. In Tamil Nadu, the number of tests were going up, the number of cases were plateauing, until, as I said, the single event of the Koyamiru market, which suddenly turned numbers back again. So now again, there is this worry that one has to test much, much more to find out. The case of COVID-19 is a bit unusual. COVID-19 has a state of patience that, 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 that someone infected with COVID-19 can have, which is called asymptomatic. In that stage, patients will not know that they're ill, or maybe it, they will know only very transiently for a period of about a day or half a day that they feel some flu-like symptoms, but then they go back to being normal again. Interestingly, in this asymptomatic state, a patient can infect someone who is susceptible to the disease and not know that they're actually doing it. So that seems to be an interesting feature of the disease that is not seen for other diseases. One reason to do widespread testing, in principle, the testing that you ought to be doing is serological testing and not the more complex uh, PCR-based tests that are done now to determine whether you have the disease or not, is to assess what is the fraction of the population that has already been infected and just didn't know it. So what is the fraction of the population that is asymptomatic for the disease is certainly one question that we need to try to answer for COVID-19 in India. What's the behavior of COVID-19 been? as a function as time has gone on, certainly over the last week or two weeks. The numbers of cases seem to be rising steadily throughout the country. If you were to look at that rise and try to imagine what function might best describe that, it would best be described as a linear increase. That's interesting because usually epidemics, when they take off, take off exponentially. And you should be able to see that deviation from a linear increase. That is not so clear. Certainly over the last week to 10 days, it looks more linear than anything else. The doubling time currently is somewhere between 10 and 12 days, which is an improvement on the doubling time earlier when that number was between five and seven days. Given all of this, what could we expect the trajectory of COVID-19 in India to be? How do we expect matters to play out over the next week or two weeks after the lockdown is lifted? What are the sort of measures that we should take post the lockdown being lifted? A couple of things could happen in terms of the number of cases registered per day, that number could go up, plateau, and then begin to come down. And some countries have achieved this, and they've achieved a rate with which you record no or very few numbers of new cases per day. Alternatively, what could happen, and what appears to be happening in India, is that you see only one side of that curve. You see only the increase. So the number of cases is going up, or at best, it increases by the same number every day. But you don't see the number of cases decreasing. At least we haven't been able to see that so far. That suggests that you're not anywhere near the peak, and it may lie, if it does lie at all, anywhere in the vicinity of now. That it should happen only maybe a week or two weeks or three weeks later. But what's even more worrying is the possibility that what you're really seeing is the overall increase towards epidemic proportions of the disease and the point at which it becomes impossible or far more difficult to control its spread than it was earlier. The asset test for this will be what happens to cases in Mumbai, in Chennai, in any areas where you have sufficient densities of people. It's in these areas that reducing the contact between people, allowing for physical distancing, are hardest. And that will be the real test of our ability to control the spread of COVID-19. In work that we've done, we've looked at ways of mitigating the exit from mitigating the problems associated with the exit from the lockdown. What we suggested is one possible way of making sure that you can still manage to hold the disease in place, to rein it in, 
while allowing people to go back to work, is to have a staggered entry into the workplace. So imagine that you, you split your workers into three parts and have a third of them go to work for two days, Monday and Tuesday, and stay back for the next four days. Have the second third go to work over Wednesday and Thursday and stay back for the next four days. And have the final third go to work on Friday and Saturday and then stay back for the next two days, after which the whole cycle repeats. This way you can ensure that people go back to work while ensuring that the densities of people who are out at any time are never such that controlling them or allowing to allowing them too much physical proximity to allow the disease to be passed from person to person is correspondingly reduced. This may be one option for the exit from the lockdown. We'll have to see what happens in the future and to see and to hope, in a sense, that we are successful in this endeavor to ensure that COVID-19 in India never really goes out of hand.